Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of our viewers to the second lecture in the consortium spring lecture series on speaking science in public controversies. I have to confess that when we planned this lecture series a year ago, we of course had no idea that we would all now be facing a global pandemic. And it makes the focus of this series, the challenges of communicating science all the more important. We are hugely privileged to have as our guest speaker today, Dr. Laura Helmuth, who is the health and science editor at the Washington Post. And as of April 13th coming up, she will be editor in chief of Scientific American. We're also delighted to have as a faculty commentator, my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Nagler, from the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Minnesota. Let me just do uh, a very brief introduction. This lecture series is presented by the University of Minnesota's Consortium on Law and Values in Health Environment and the Life Sciences, which is a now 20 year old collaboration, a university wide center that links 19 leading centers and programs all around the U to address the societal issues posed by biomedicine and the life sciences. Many of those issues we are all grappling with now furiously, infectious disease, science communication, others. Special thanks to the planning committee, which includes Michael Osterholm, director of SIDRAP. I think Mike is working 24 seven on the COVID-19 challenges. Amy Kircher, co-director of strategic partnerships and the research collaborative, Mike Sadowski, director of the Biotech Institute, and Michael Georgiev, director of the Center for Neurobehavioral Development. I also want to give special thanks to our consortium staff because transitioning this to a fully online webinar is not without its challenges. And finally, thanks to the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communications because they've been a, a stalwart ally in pulling this series together. Uh, this event is being recorded and as you know, webcast, we record all of the consortium events in keeping with the public mission of the university. And the video will be posted on the consortium website in about two weeks for free public access, sharing, teaching, whatever use you see fit. We have a, a big, and a wonderful audience online today. And we very much want to hear from you when, you get, when we get to QA. The way you send us your question, as you should see next to your screen, is by emailing us at consortm, C-O-N-S-O-R-T-M at U-M-N dot E-D-U. And those questions will be immediately transferred to me as the moderator. You can also please tweet about this event at hashtag science controversies. Uh, one note for those of you who are getting continuing education credits. Uh, to receive CLE and CME credits, you need to complete uh, two forms that you'll get by email, an evaluation form and a credit tracker form. So please remember to do that. Um, the speakers and planning committee have no relevant disclosures. But if you'd like to look at a copy of the disclosure summary, it's available on our website. It's now my uh, very big pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Helmuth. Um, I have to confess, I subscribe to the Washington Post uh, and I follow Laura's great tweets. So I'm a fan. Uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Helmuth is the health and science editor right now of the Washington Post, soon to be editor-in-chief at Scientific American. She's also immediate past president of the National Association of Science Writers. Uh, she has a long and very distinguished CV, just a few highlights. She's been an editor for publications, many of you know, including National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, Smithsonian Magazine, I read that too, and Science Magazine as well as a freelance writer or editor for the New York Times, 
Nautilus, National Wild Wildlife, and Stanford Magazine. She is a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on Science Communication. Some of you who are with us for the first lecture in this series by Dietrich Scheufele know that he too is participating in that process. And she serves on numerous advisory boards. Um, she holds a doctorate in cognitive neuroscience. So she comes by the Dr. Helmut, honestly, uh, from the University of California at Berkeley and attended the UC Santa Cruz Science Writing Program. And if you do want to follow her on Twitter, as I do, uh, her address is at Laura Helmuth. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Helmuth. Hey, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for organizing this whole seminar. It's uh, it, I, the list of speakers. I, I want to watch all of them. Uh, Vish in a couple of weeks is going to be great. Uh, but this is it's so important um, to be talking about how to communicate better about science, help people understand and value science um, and, and apply it appropriately to, to controversial subjects. So I'm gonna share my screen and start my slides here. Look okay, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, okay, excellent, good. So today we're gonna to talk about um, how the media covers science, health, and the environment. Those are my specialties. Some of these lessons apply to how the media uh, covers all kinds of subjects. In my opinion, basically every subject should be a science subject because there's some scholarship or research or evidence that that is, you know, that should be brought to bear on basically every every question about um, about modern life and past life. Uh, so I'm going to focus though today on um, three particular challenges uh, that the media is really grappling with right now. One is being falsely accused of being false news, um, and then there's this great competition with actual fake news, with stuff that's made up by trolls or bots or bad actors and including misinformation, disinformation, and you know, conspiracy theories, all these things that are circulating so well on um, the same platforms that the Post and Scientific American and um, you know, legitimate news sources use. And it's very hard for people to tell the difference between what's a real and reliable source of information and what isn't. So that's a constant battle. It's an arms race. We're not necessarily winning. Um, so thanks to all of you for coming, for caring about this sort of subject and for kind of helping improve the signal to noise ratio in the world. Uh, and then of course, I, you know, <laughs> the coronavirus is all we've been talking about for three months now in my department at the Post. And we're seeing some of the biggest challenges of dealing with misinformation, of helping inform the public, of dealing with controversy. Uh, it's all coming out in the coronavirus uh, coverage and the, in the coronavirus situation. So um, one of the challenges is that uh, the president of the United States wakes up and tweets that the press is making up its sources or um, making up facts that you can't trust it, that we're the enemy of the people. So it's making, making it harder, of course, to do the job. It's making it more dangerous to do the job. So um, we're trying to evolve and adapt and react to, to that without you know, being led around, around by the nose. Um, and then the other big challenge is that false information, you know, because it doesn't have to abide by reality, um, people can make up all kinds of you know, conspiracy theories and bananas things. Um, today, apparently QAnon is, is sure, and a lot of people in this country believe that there's a Navy ship uh, the comfort that is docked in, in New York City uh, with the goal of um, easing some of the hospital crisis around coronavirus, uh, they're saying that it's actually being used to hide trafficked children. And so that's what the, you know, that's what the other world is talking about right now. I'm not sure how many people are spreading this, but the, the whole QAnon, um, there are more and more people who believe these just ridiculous conspiracy theories, and we're expecting you know, around coronavirus, it's even worse, and with people isolated and scared and confused, those are just perfect situations for more misinformation spreading. And so what we're doing to, to try to adapt um, as journalists is be more open about how it is that we do our work. How does reporting work? Um, how do we write our stories? Where do we find our sources? And then we're also, um, there's a lot, of a lot of research in the last couple of years on misinformation, on how it spreads and where it comes from, on what effects it has. 
Um, and we're using that research both as a subject of journalistic inquiry and to sort of inform how we do our own work which I'll share some examples of later. And then um, we're also trying to, you know, make sure we're using the proper experts, um, representative experts when we, when we, when we um, are sourcing our stories, our, our journal articles or our videos. And then um, also because it's really intertwined, like the, the same sort of suspicion and mistrust of journalism um, to a lesser extent some people have around the process of scientific research is sort of, uh, um, uh, disrespect for expertise, uh, questioning of how do they know it, you know, th th there's a lot of, a lot of the same issues. Um, and so one of the things that we all, that science journalists always do is try to show how research works, show that it's a human process, show what's, what's working well, what's not. Um, it, but I think that's become even more urgent recently as we're dealing with so much misinformation and mistrust. And so here's an example. We um, just had an article about well, what is an anonymous source anyway, um, and how do journalists use them? Uh, and there used to be, I think, a reluctance among journalists to, to make ourselves the story, um, which was well intentioned, but it had unfortunately the effect of, of you know, any any community can end up with a lot of jargon and sort of insider knowledge, and not realize how mysterious the whole process is to people who are outside of that subculture. So we're trying to just be more open about what we do, more transparent. And part of this is just labeling. So this is a, a really excellent source, um, a publication called STAT that for, focuses on uh, biomedical research and they've been doing fantastic coverage of coronavirus. Um, but this is just, um, I circled that this is labeled first opinion. Um, and the post does this too. We have uh, stories that are labeled as perspective, uh, which is a first person type of thing where you, where you give your own perspective on the news. Uh, we have uh, opinion pieces, uh, we have analysis pieces, and then we have straight news stories where we're just reporting what's happening in the world. And it's, it's really hard for readers to know um, that a news story and an opinion story, even though they're both appearing in the Washington Post, have very different sort of standards of information, um, different, you know, speaking to different audiences about different things. And so what we're trying to do, especially on social media, is whenever um, something is shared, the default is to say opinion, colon, and then the headline. So it's clear that this is an opinion piece. It's not, a, 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 we're not presenting this, this idea as a fact. So, um, and most publications are trying to just do a better job of that, because how, how would anybody know the difference? And, um, sort of at a meta level, one of the things that's, that's really important for journalists to do is reveal um, misleading or false or fraudulent information, especially if it has the potential to harm people. And so um, we've had a series of stories about stem cell clinics, and there are about a thousand of them, probably more by now, uh, that are making all kinds of completely unverified claims about their procedures. Um, and, and so there's, to, to to distinguish, there's a, a legitimate line of really important research on uh, stem cells and how they can be used in, in medicine. This is a long process, you know, involving actual clinical trials and, you know, proper research protocols and all that. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for that to, to turn into, you know, hopefully evidence-based actual um, treatments for people, um, these stem cell clinics are just kind of taking that name and saying, uh, that if they suck out a little bit of your fat, spin it around in the centrifuge, and then stick it back in you, that it can like solve all these health problems, including macular degeneration, lung disease, um, arthritis, and there's no evidence for any of it, but the FDA has not, um, until recently, has, has not done much to, to crack down on it. So one thing journalism can do is sort of help uh, expose unreality to people, especially if they can be harmed financially or, or physically. Um, so this is an example of that sort of story. And it's also an example of one of the ways we're showing our work. And so there's a, uh, this is just a, a screenshot of the story where we talk about what, um, about what, uh, how, we, how we got this story, that it's based on memos, telephone scripts, emails, financial records. We talk to these people, here's their expertise, here's, the way we, here's why they would know. We corroborated it, you know, the, the company itself uh, it confirmed a lot of the details to sort of show like this is how we did the work. And then um, this is, a, you know, as I was saying, there's some 
some of the same problems with research being mistrusted and journalism being mistrusted. Uh, you know, people, some people say, you know, one day you say coffee is good for you, one day you say bad, it's bad for you. And so we're trying to kind of show in this story that nutrition science is just really hard. There's so many variables. It's, it's uh, you know, the, the effects, if there are any, are probably subtle. Um, and, and this is why. This is, you know, this is why you get uh, every week a different, you know, a different study saying a different thing. And, and also I think within, within health journalism, health and science journalism, the people who specialize in it have gotten a lot better about not falling for every single study that's published, um, especially if it's an outlier. Uh, you know, I think the, the whole uh, crisis of reproducibility, that some of the most intriguing findings and surprising uh, findings, it turns out that they're, they don't replicate, they don't hold up. When somebody else tries to do the same experiment, they don't get the same results. Um, occasionally it's fraud, but sometimes it's just through chance that you get data that look promising and then they, they end up not being what you think they are. And so I think being very aware of that as science journalists, we've, uh, you know, we realize that just because something is published in science or nature, that doesn't mean it's true. Uh, and so rather than doing stories based on individual studies, I think the, the trend has been within science journalism to, to look at multiple studies, see what the, the bulk of the evidence is saying, uh, rather than kind of ping-ponging ping -ponging back and forth. So when it comes to dealing more directly with misinformation, um, we have a, a pretty high bar for what, you know, when we debunk something. If something's, if, if something's made up, um, I mean, there's, there's a website called Snopes that specializes in kind of fact-checking what's real and what's a myth. Um, in journalism, uh, we, we have a pretty high bar. We, if, if there's a myth that's not circulating widely, we, we tend to you know, have a very high bar for debunking it because we don't want to expose more people to the false information. So when we, but when we do, when there is something circulating widely because say a United States Senator is repeating the myth that the Chinese invented the coronavirus or something like that, then we're very, um, then we try to use the, the research on misinformation to debunk it correctly. And so some of the findings are that, you know, you wanna make sure people know this is misinformation rather than just repeating it. Make your rebuttals clear and simple. Uh, don't repeat the myth if you can't. Um, and what's really important is it's, it's hard to tell people, you know, this thing you may have believed or your friend believed is just false. So you try to take a humane approach and explain why people might have believed it or shared it on Facebook. Um, if you can, you know, say what's actually true instead and uh, try to make it you know, as non-threatening and as, and as you know, empathetic as you can. Um, and then the, the main kind of storytelling challenge um, is to make reality as memorable and as sticky and as fun to read about as myth. And that's, that's a big challenge, but that's the kind of the goal of, of good science writing. So here's just some examples. Um, this is a story about a conspiracy theory and I highlighted in yellow, um, it's a conspiracy theory. There's no evidence for it. It's basically, baselessly insinuated. And this is the kind of language, this is at NBC. Um, you often, th this, this is the sort of thing we're doing more now that I think we used to not do a few years ago. And now we're, uh, trying to be uh, much more clear uh, across journalism when something's false, to, to call a lie a lie. Another thing we try to do, um, you know, one of the, the big challenges of science and health reporting is the anti-vaccine movement. Um, there's, a, I think, sort of a perception that it's just this widespread understanding, and, and part of the conspiracy theory is that uh, journalists are colluding with scientists and doctors and pediatric pediatricians. I think pediatricians are in on some conspiracy theory to like poison children. Um, so one of the things you know, we try, we, we do a lot of coverage of the anti-vaccine movement, trying to, to you know, explain why they're wrong, explain what's right, explain how vaccines work and all that to try and um, you know, just combat this, this really dangerous myth. Uh, and so one of the things we, we found out is that uh, most of the ads on Facebook are, there's just two groups who do it. This is um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's a notorious conspiracy theorist. Uh, and then also, well, why do they do it? They make a lot of money off of it. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people selling uh, natural health products, saying this will protect you from the flu. Whatever you do, don't give your kid a, a vaccine. You know, just give them vitamin D instead or vitamin C. 
And so um, I think revealing that kind of helps people. I mean, obviously not the people who are super dedicated anti-vaxxers, but the ones who are just hearing about it and wondering, well, why is there such a fuss about it? Why, you know, why are people so worried? What should, you know, should I be worried? Should I not be doing this for my child? Um, and so sort of showing the motivation is, is one way we think can be an effective way of kind of helping reality and evidence win out over mythology. So it doesn't always work and we don't always win and often we don't. So um, the idea that people would believe the earth is flat was just kind of a joke several years ago. Nobody believed it. It was, you know, how we distinguish ourselves as modern people from those, you know, savages in the past. Um, but YouTube had this series of videos, really elaborate, you know, really well produced, uh, made to look like a Nova science documentary. Um, revealing this conspiracy about how actually the earth is flat, but there's a, a big plot um, by the United Nations to, to fool you into thinking it's a globe with, for reasons. And Antarctica is actually an ice, an ice wall around the edge of the earth. And that's why all the water doesn't fall out is because Antarctica is there to kind of keep it all in. Big plot. Anyhow, but lots and lots of people believe this, and, and you know, not just as a joke, but they really started wondering. And, and the way that the algorithm at YouTube worked is that if you, um, if you looked at one of these videos, then you'd be recommended a, a whole bunch of others. And also a lot of videos that weren't about Flat Earth were pointing to this one as recommendations for what you should read next, just because you know, they were popular and they were monetized and people were making a lot of money off of them. And so this is, uh, in the 90s, um, scientists said, we cloned a sheep, we landed a robot on Mars, and that's what science journalists were talking about too. And scientists today, for the last time, the Earth is round. So it doesn't feel like we're always making progress. On um, this one, we aren't. But so journalists and you know, a, a lot of people, not this isn't just something journalists did, but we were able to report on this phenomenon, that it's a problem, that it's based on YouTube's algorithms. And so YouTube did change its algorithms to kind of hide these videos, to stop monetizing them. They, de they didn't deplatform them, but they demonetized them. So to make, um, make it less, to, to kind of remove the, um, the motive for people to do this and also just to, to make it harder to find. So, uh, but the idea is still out there and it's, it's gonna be bubbling up for a while because once conspiracy theory starts, it's really hard to stop it. And with coronavirus, of course, the conspiracy theories started immediately. Um, and BuzzFeed, you know, back in January, started a running list of all the misinformation and disinformation. And, um, you know, of course, it's, you know, believing the earth is flat is, you know, not good for people. It's, it, you know, it, it enhances a conspiratorial mindset. It messes, you know, with your ability to, to learn, to understand physics, to understand anything about the world. Um, I'm sure encourages paranoia, but obviously with coronavirus, it you know it really is a matter of life or death. If you believe um, that it's that you know only Chinese people can get it, then you won't you know participate in social distancing, or if it's a plot, or if uh, you know it was made up by the military. Like it, it's just really dangerous to to be spreading misinformation and disinformation about coronavirus. Um, the the list was very long. They finally had to abandon it because they just couldn't keep up. There was too much coming out. One, this is just one example, um, a lot of miracle cures. And this is, uh, the anti-vaxxers showed up immediately. Um, there never was, <laughs> never was a global pandemic so bad that an anti-vaxxer couldn't show up and make it even worse. Uh, so they just jumped on it and are trying to monetize it and still are. They're, 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 and they're doing pretty well. I'm sure they're making a, a bunch of money off of selling vitamin supplements while people are scared. And one of the hard things is it's hard to compete with all this misinformation, especially because um, reality is, is really bizarre too. I mean, it, reality is scary. Uh, there's, you, you know, in South Korea, one of the, one of the biggest clusters um, was linked to a doomsday sect with a messianic leader. So like that seems like something that would be made up, um, but it's actually real. So how do you know the difference? And it's really, it's, it's no wonder people get confused. And it's, it's kind of our job as journalists to, to tell them the difference and to tell them what's real and what's not. It's also the job of the platforms, of the social media platforms. So Facebook, Google, Twitter, um, they, they're all trying, and YouTube somewhat, um, they're all really trying to, to tamp down misinformation. It's very hard to do. Um, I think they need to try a lot harder 
there are more things they could do, um, but it's, yeah, that's that's kind of the struggle. And one of the things that, this is a, another story in the, in the post, one of the things that uh, journalism is really doing is trying to hold the platforms accountable for presenting good information. And, you know, in a way it's self-interest. I mean, if they ran more, if they, you know, privileged uh, real journalism, that's, you know, it's good for us, but it's also just good for reality and good for people. So um, I'm going to go through just some of the types of stories that we're doing on the health and science desk to, to combat this misinformation and, and you know, try to help people understand the coronavirus uh, the pandemic. And uh, there's a, a kind of a, a common strategy is um, just FAQs, Q&As. Uh, we've we have multiple reader submission forms, and and all the the major uh, publications do asking people for their experiences, for their questions, what are they worried about, and we try to systematically um, just address what people are wondering about at this moment. And so we have FAQs that are updated all the time, um, always looking for more questions, looking for places where people are curious or confused or scared. Um, and we do. We have a daily newsletter too, where the, the, a big portion of it is uh, answering reader questions, and that's that's a big function of of journalism. I mean, I think if you look at who people trust, uh, you know, they they trust the CDC, they trust NIH, they trust Tony Fauci, which they absolutely should. All of those places are you know experts and reliable, but they're not as nimble about answering people's questions, um, whereas the journalists can be. And then another thing we're doing is just showing the science from the beginning. So this this article published in um, mid January. Uh, so we've been you know, following what's the research on uh, the genetics, on how it's spreading, on what's the, the R not the what's the infectivity, uh, you know what where, where's progress on vaccines, um, you know what therapeutics are being tested, and just kind of following the science very closely. And it's it's an interesting moment because we're getting, um, you know, people who had never heard of like a zoonotic disease before. Their vocabulary has expanded dramatically just in the past few months. We think people understand like flattening the curve and social distancing and, um, you know, and it, how diseases spread through the population and what droplets are um, in a way that, you know, they hadn't, hadn't necessarily paid attention to as much before. So I think there's a much bigger audience for this. And we're, we're trying to, you know, to serve both the audience of people who did know a lot of these things or had been following it, but, but really to serve people who are newly interested and uh, are, are just really curious about where did this come from. And even though we, you know, we've, we've published, I'm sure, you know, a few thousand articles at this point about the coronavirus, and we just keep having to explain things over and over um, because there's uh, more people every day who just want to know what's going on. And it also, you know, principles that people need to understand that, it, you know, just because somebody tests negative, um, what is a false negative? What's a false positive? How, what is sensitivity? What is specificity of, of diagnostic tests? Uh, which are things people, you know, didn't really have to worry about that much before. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons it matters is if somebody tests negative, it doesn't mean they can't get it in the future. It might mean they actually do have it and the test just wasn't quite sensitive enough or there was a problem with the sampling. Um, so we're doing a lot of kind of just basic understanding of how the research works, how medicine works, how the how testing works. And then, of course, this is, you know, an incredibly difficult, dangerous, stressful, scary, um, just horrible situation for people who are in the hospital now. Um, and so we're, we're trying to cover just the human decisions that are made every day um, and will increasingly be made that are that are life or death decisions. Um, and one of those is when, you know, what should the do not resuscitate policies be? Where are they happening? Who's making the decisions? Is it because of rationing? Is it because of a shortage of material? Um, is it because of danger or, or you know, th what we know about the outcomes? Like who's making the decisions? How are they being made? And who are the people who are, are, are dealing with it? Um, this is one of the a more hopeful stories. So one of the other kind of categories of things we're covering is, okay, what needs to happen next? Like if, if we're gonna reopen society, what do we need? And you know we need more testing, diagnostic testing, um, more contact tracing. Uh, we need to understand the immunity to people who had who 
have been infected, are they immune? If so, for how long? Um, and, and a big part of that is getting tests for antibodies that will show um, if you were infected and, if, and, and potentially give a measure of how immune you are now. And um, one of the things about this story, uh, the, the story page has this headline, uh, testing survivor's blood could reopen the US. Uh, when we had it on the homepage of the Washington Post, uh, we called it, it, as it is in the, what we call the sub headline here, we had uh, serology test. And serology is a word that, you know, most people have never heard that word. Um, but it was, it was one of the most read stories that day on the Washington Post. And we had the word serology right there on the, on the homepage in big letters. And so, you know, it's a, it took a global pandemic to do it, but we're, we're really um, greatly expanding people's uh, knowledge of science and health. So that's what we're doing on coronavirus. Some of it, we're, it's been endless. We've, we've uh, been covering intensively and, and it's, it's going to be a long haul. Um, this is going to be the story of the year, probably the next few years. Uh, so we're trying to inform people, um, answer their questions, hold the administration accountable for what it is or isn't doing to, to deal with the crisis. Um, and we're always, you know, it, we just have to keep finding new ways to, to tell the story, new sources, you know, bringing new information to light while we're trying to swat down uh, dangerous conspiracy theories. So there are a lot of things that, um, that anybody can do to sort of help the process of improving the signal to noise ratio in the world and, and helping good information spread farther and faster than disinformation. And um, one of them is to share information, uh, share story ideas. Uh, if, if there's stuff you know that you think needs att you know, national attention in the press, uh, there are ways to share that with, with any journalism outlet. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the homepage of the Washington Post where there's a little link so you can um, share news tips confidentially and we have like six ways to do it. Um, Signal, WhatsApp isn't super, none of these is perfect. There, there are trade-offs in you know, which type you would want to use, uh, encrypted email, secure drop. Um, and you can, you, can also, you can always contact reporters directly uh, pretty much any story has the reporter's name at the bottom and their email at the bottom. So uh, you can usually just contact somebody directly. But if, if for some reason um, you're not comfortable uh, sharing your name or you don't want to go through regular channels, um, there are encrypted ways to share information with journalists. And then for, for anybody listening who's, um, who's uh, you know, has um, expertise that's relevant, uh, especially for science, these are for science journalists or health or environment journalists, there are ways to sort of volunteer to be a, an expert source um, and to help journalists find you uh, and to, to sort of agree to participate in the process in that way. Um, and one of them is run by American Association for the Advancement of Science, it's called Sciline. And they have a, a database of, of, of researchers from all kinds of different fields uh, who agree to respond to queries uh, from journalists. And this, the, the target audience for this is reporters, who are working on, um, often reporters who don't necessarily have specialized science or health or environment background, but who are working on a science involved story and have basic questions. Uh, and of course, you know, right now, everybody's a science reporter, everybody's a health reporter. Um, we've got people from sports, from um, you know, arts and style, from general assignment, basically everybody who is covering anything else that's been shut down uh, aside from like financial uh, reporters, like they're all covering coronavirus. So um, there's a desperate need for people who understand epidemiology, infectious disease, disease transmission, um, all these things to, to be willing to talk to journalists and to make sure that we get it right. Uh, there's another database called, uh, that's run by a, a group called 500 Women Scientists, which is now like thousands and thousands of women scientists. Uh, and this is, the, the goal here is to, to get the right sources to the right reporters. Uh, but it's also uh, trying to improve the, 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 what we call the byline count, or yeah, the source count. Um, you know, we, we want to have, uh, we want to publish stories that, publish articles that um, represent, uh, that are representative, that have more women's voices and not just, you know, tenured white men from Harvard being quoted all the time. Some of my best, not, yeah, some of our best sources are tenured white men from Harvard, but that's not who we should be covering, or not who we should be quoting all the time. 
Uh, and then this is another effort, um, it's uh, called Diverse Sources, and for both, for the last two, and, and for Silent to some extent, you can volunteer yourself, just enter your own information, and then uh, journalists can search for it when they're looking for somebody who knows something about paleontology, they can find you. And then for those of you who are educators, um, any class you teach, uh, digital media literacy can be part of that. Um, there's a, 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 a faculty member at ASU, um, Christy Roschke, who uh, does a lot of trainings on this, and this is a screenshot of a blog post she wrote recently um, about how any, any class you teach, like part of what the students need to take away is understanding where to get good information, where to get trustworthy information, and that's something that can be part of your, of your classes. And then um, I encourage people to, to write about your own research. Um, readers really, really respond well when somebody writes about what, you know, what's it like to be you know, an ER doc. Obviously, that's like the most dramatic. Um, but people like to read about what's it like to be a paleontologist, what's it like to be a marine scientist, um, any kind of medical research especially. When people write about what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, it often, like there's, a, there's just a really good human connection and it yeah, humanizes your field. Uh, it's, it's very democratizing. It kind of takes you, know, takes you off your pedestal a little bit, if not that you put yourself on one, but people tend to put researchers on pedestals. Uh, and especially if you have an opinion. Um, so the opinion pages of every uh, newspaper are dominated by, um, people who think they know something about politics. A lot of times they do. There's some excellent opinion pieces, uh, excellent jur opinion journalism out there, but I think there's an opportunity for a lot more opinion pieces and first person and perspective articles written by people with expertise um, in various fields of science, in the law, in research, in medicine. Um, and I think there's just, the editors are, are kind of hungry for these stories. And also um, Twitter, like there's a, there's a lot of bad stuff on Twitter, but but the best Twitter is um, science Twitter, journalism Twitter, legal Twitter is really good too. So uh, if you're not already active on Twitter, it's a, it's a good way to um, entertain yourself right now, especially, but it's also a good way to really um, talk about things you know. And you can reach journalists that way because we're on Twitter all the time. And so, um, it's a good way to sort of identify yourself as, you know, if something's in the news and you know about it and you tweet about it, it there's a good chance to be contacted for comment. Um, people might write about your tweets. They might, you know, be inspired to, to look in, at sources that you recommend. So it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's, it's a powerful platform uh, for reaching people in, in unexpected ways and very quickly, obviously. And so these are some places uh, that you can write for. Uh, the conversation is, I highly recommend, they specialize in um, articles written by experts about their own research. And this is all kinds of scholarship. You can see at the top here, it's arts and culture, economy, education, a lot of science. Um, they have really good editors who, uh, who work with you well to, to kind of de-jargonize your articles and, and kind of make them accessible for people who aren't familiar at all with your field. And this is a, a screenshot from the, from the Washington Post, uh, Maria Zuber, uh, she's at MIT, and she wrote, this is a, a really nice uh, first person essay she wrote about growing up in coal country in a coal mining family, and now she's an, you know, one of the top experts on, on climate change, um, and kind of making that connection and, say, and saying with a lot of empathy that, yeah, it's hard to, to change industries, but but this is this is the way to do it, and this is why we have to do it. It was very, you know, more powerful, I think, because she had that human connection. And one nice thing about when you write um, for a place like Slate, this is yeah, this is a screenshot from Slate, is uh, you can you can really express yourself in a way that you can't when you're publishing scientific articles. Um, so Ray Pierre Humbert, uh, he was on a, a National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine panel about geoengineering. And the, the, or the report that they published was very clear that you know, there are a lot of problems with geoengineering. Here are the ethical issues. Here are the, the ways to think through it um, and in very formal language. And so at the same time, he wrote this when I was an editor at Slate, um, saying very straightforwardly, OK, here's what we said in the, in, to translate, basically, this National Academies 
uh, publication, what we mean is this is ridiculous, don't do this. Uh, and you can say something very frankly in, a, in an opinion magazine like Slate that you can't say for the National Academies. Uh, Scientific American, uh, I start next week, please write for us. Uh, there's a whole section called observations uh, that's especially that's opinion arguments analyses for person stories either about your own research or about your field or whatever you have expertise and it doesn't have to be about what you're doing yourself and then scientific american also publishes scientists writing about their own research in more of a news uh, not news but in a, in a magazine feature form that doesn't necessarily have to be opinionated uh, and this is just an example of, of a really effective Twitter campaign. So the NRA um, told doctors, uh, you know, stay in your lane. When doctors uh, on Twitter were, were um, talking about the, the, the damage they see from gun violence patients. Um, and uh, anyhow, the, so the NRA tried to shut, tried to, you know, tell them to go away. And then they came back in full force and, and they, there was a, a kind of a Twitter meme for a while of, of uh, ER doctors showing, taking pictures of them in their scrubs or their emergency rooms and just showing blood everywhere from, from gun violence. Um, and they hashtag, they did a hashtag, this is our lane. It was very powerful, it was very moving. Um, and we, at the Post, we covered it, but a, a lot of publications then covered it and sort of amplified what was happening in Twitter so that everybody not on Twitter would also see it, you know, just see how powerful it was and how effective the doctors were at getting their message out on Twitter. And then um, this is the best headline I've ever written in my career of writing headlines. Um, this, this from you know, in the way back time during the Obama administration, Fox News had a poll. Um, they occasionally a conservative news site will get worked up about basic research, and and um, you know I don't know if you all remember the. Um, the Golden Fleece Award, uh, where the idea was that scientists are fleecing taxpayers by doing ridiculous studies. Uh, and, and they figured out that, there, that the National Science Foundation was funding research on duck genitalia, which was, it's fascinating research that you can, I don't know if you can see, there's, this, is a, this is a ruddy duck and it has a corkscrew-shaped penis and the females have corkscrew-shaped genital tracts and it's all like an example of uh, this interesting coevolution that gives the female control over which duck fertilizes her eggs. It's really cool stuff. They have some videos that are spectacular. I highly recommend after this checking it out. Um, but anyhow, but Fox News decided this was dirty and uh, had a poll and 80, 89% of their respondents said, oh, this is filthy. We shouldn't be funding it. And so the researcher at the center of it wrote a really nice first person story, very calm, very welcoming, good sense of humor, you know, she never expected to get famous this way, but here's why, Dr. Genitalia, you're so interesting. And it worked really well. So if you ever find yourself attacked by a Twitter mob or attacked by right-wing media, um, you know, write about it. It, it, it can help defang it and, and help people find out ways to support you. So um, in summary, these are some of the things you can do. Um, as I mentioned, you know, share information, talk to journalists. If you see something that's if it's wrong in an article, we'll correct it. You know, get in touch with a reporter and say, "Hey, you, you know, that's not what an antibody is," and and we'll fix it and, and run a correction to show that we fixed it. Um, you know, be active on Twitter. Uh, you know, amplify it. when you, when you see good information, amplify it. When you see bad information, you know, even if you feel like a jerk, it's 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 a service to the world to say no, that's a myth. Um, you can sign up for these databases, write for yourself, and then just you know be an advocate for evidence. It's social media is is all social, and it's as good as the people in it make it. So um, being you know part of the signal to noise ratio is 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 really a service right now. And then um, you know with the coronavirus, so people are reading more news than they ever have, and coronavirus, you know, a global pandemic, is ultimately a local story because depending on where you live. Um, you either have testing or don't. Your hospital's prepared or they're not. Um, it's spreading in these, you know, in these places or not. And this is all like what local news is for, is for protecting you in a pandemic. But the problem is that newspapers, especially local newspapers, are highly dependent on print advertising. And typically, um, who advertises in a local newspaper? The department stores, movie theaters, um, you know, car dealerships, and all these places are shut down, they're not advertising, and so we're seeing just this collapse of local papers. Um, so, 
I know this sounds selfish, but the best thing, you know, one of the things you can really do right now at a moment when newspapers are in, and magazines are either going to survive or not, like the, in the next couple months, we're just going to see a massive wave of, of newspaper deaths in addition to all the tragic human deaths. So um, if you can, you know, subscribe. We really appreciate it by gift subscriptions. A lot of publications are nonprofit um, and they, you know, they can, they can take um, donations. So thank you for considering that too. Thank you for coming today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and uh, here's how to contact me. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Laura. We're getting, um, we're getting wonderful questions online. Um, what I next want to do is, well, first of all, I want to encourage more. So remember, if you have a question, you need to email consortm at umn.edu, and you should see that next to your screen and in the chat function. Uh, keep them coming. Um, we always ask a faculty member to give a brief commentary, just to get another point of view out there before we open it up for QA. So I'm going to very briefly introduce Professor Rebecca Nagler now. Uh, she's Associate Professor in the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, much of her research examines the effects of routine exposure to health information in the media, with a special focus on cancer, conflicting and often controversial information about cancer prevention and screening. Her work's been funded by the National Cancer Institute, American Cancer Society, and others. And she received her doctorate in communications from the University of Pennsylvania. So if we could switch over to showing Dr. Nagler, that would be great. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Susan, for the introduction. And thank you, Laura, for the uh, terrific talk. I, I'd like to take the opportunity today to um, Kind of pivot a little bit and tell you a little bit about how I think some of the the work we're doing in media effects research, specifically in the health context, kind of what kind of brings to bear on um, what Laura has had to say, and and I think especially to the current case of of COVID nineteen. So Laura spoke with us about the challenges that journalists uh, face today, particularly amid accusations of being uh, fake news, and I think she offered very practical suggestions. Uh, for what journalists, scientists, and the public can do to address those challenges, um, including strategies for building public trust, tackling misinformation, uh, and so forth. And I think implied in a lot of Laura's comments uh, in her discussion is really the influence that news media coverage of health, science, and the environment can have on the public, right? There's sort of a, an assumption of effects in all of that discussion, and that's where I want to spend some of my time. Uh, as a media effects researcher, um, and one specifically who focuses on mass media effects on health-related outcomes. Um, I'm hoping I can provide some insight into what these effects can look like, um, how they unfold, and the types of media coverage and effects that I'm most concerned about right now. Um, media effects research has shown that the influence of exposure to health and science information can actually be really positive, right? We see tremendous outcomes in the way of sort of increasing uh, learning, right, related to health and scientific knowledge, um, shaping of beliefs, promoting healthy or pro-social behaviors, increasing support for public policies. These are all really great outcomes. And the type of reporting uh, that Laura's team has been doing at the Post is, is in part to be credited with, with some of those effects. Really high quality journalism can have tremendously positive effects for, for many of us. But by the same token, there's also evidence that media exposure can have negative or adverse consequences uh, on public understanding and behavior. And there are a few areas where research is really concentrating at this point and thinking about those negative impacts. Um, one, you know, is very much germane to Laura's talk and that's efforts to understand um, the effects of exposure to health and science misinformation. Certainly that's a huge area of study right now. She alluded to a lot of the research and key findings from that and how it's sort of informing and driving journalistic practice, which is terrific. Um, and actually the first speaker in the consortium series this spring Petrum Schoifele, a science communication researcher at uh, Wisconsin-Madison, talked a lot about that in, in his talk. And then my uh, colleague, Professor Emily Braga, 
um, was the faculty commentator there, and, and her expertise is really in health misinformation, particularly in the social media environment. So um, instead, I think what I'll do is I'll talk about the other um, two areas of work, thinking about these negative impacts of, of news media coverage um, of health and science. And the first is really understanding the effects of exposure to conflicting and often controversial health information um, and also science information. And the second is understanding what effects unfold when health and science information is politicized. Uh, and I think to illustrate the key points here, I'm going to focus on what I'm seeing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, given that it is, as Laura said, really the most urgent public health issue of our time. Um, and so first starting with this idea of conflict and controversy, um, we found in our past work that when people perceive conflict and controversy around a health issue, for example, uh, Laura talked about the sort of conflicting research studies in the nutrition domain, um, or what's perceived to be sort of competing findings about coffee and alcohol consumption and fish consumption and so forth, um, or increasingly conflicting uh, guidelines around cancer screening, including mammography and prostate uh, cancer screening, um, or increasingly with conflicting advice around e-cigarettes. Um, when people perceive conflicting information, what we know is that this can generate confusion about what they should be doing, right? What they should be eating, whether they should be getting screened and when, and so on and so forth. But it can also undermine um, trust in those health recommendations. And perhaps even more concerning is that there's some indication that exposure to conflict and controversy about one set of issues um, can actually potentially spill or carry over into other unrelated topics, right? Even those about which there is expert consensus, whether it's physical activity recommendations or fruit and vegetable consumption, right? So the sort of cumulative exposure to conflicting and controversial health and science information could actually really undermine broader trust, um, potentially in science and health recommendations. And that would be really, um, have really important consequences for public health promotion efforts and so forth. Um, without question, I think we need to be thinking about these issues in the context of COVID-19. Um, in just a matter of weeks, we've already seen shifts in advice uh, around protective behaviors. Maybe one of the best examples right now is mask wearing in public. Um, and, you know, scientists and researchers are really, you know, we're, they're well equipped to understand why those shifts occur, you know, especially when you have a novel virus like this, um, there's so much we don't know. Knowledge is rapidly evolving. Um, it's the process of scientific discovery. Uh, and so it makes sense um, to sort of more learned audiences to understand why that's happening. But the public, the sort of lay audience for this information that does get propagated in the news media um, may struggle to reconcile some of those shifts and recommendations. Um, and it may instead seem like um, sort of daily swings in what they're being told to do. or um, And to the extent that people perceive expert disagreement or ever-shifting advice, there could be really important behavioral consequences of that, for example, less compliance with mitigation or suppression um, measures. I think perhaps even more concerning right now is the second phenomenon I mentioned, and that is the politicization of health and science issues. Um, and you know, some of this is sort of peppered into, I think, Laura's comments as well. Um, but what we know from past research is that when health issues become politicized, um, for example, when partisan cues are um, embedded in such messages, it really invites people to think about those issues in particular ways, um, specifically through a partisan lens um, that's consistent with one's political ideology. Um, this process is known as motivated reasoning. And, um, you know, in the case of COVID-19, from the outset, there was politicized discourse here, right? So very early on, and again, I think Laura really alluded to this, you know, the, the White House, um, sort of the administration, as well as Fox News pundits and others were calling this outright a democratic hoax, really introducing um, political language into what is otherwise a health issue. And <clears throat> even now, there's polling data continuing to show that conservatives and Republicans are much less concerned about um, COVID-19 and its impacts, its severity, and so forth than independents and uh, their Democratic counterparts. A recent Atlantic article uh, talked a lot about this and summarized it in this way that social distancing, as I qu and I quote, has come to be viewed in some quarters as a political act, uh, a way to signal which side you're on, right? 
Um, and of course, social distancing and really physical distancing depends on all of us going along with that, right? And so if it's become sort of a partisan battlefield, there's real concern about uh, what, what will ultimately transpire in terms of containing the, the spread of this disease. So um, there's also, of course, a critical role that media consumption patterns can play here, right? So not everyone is receiving the same information. Um, not everyone, for example, certainly um, has, um, is, is tuning in to the Washington Post um, Science and Health Desk. Um, we know that we have a tremendous fragmentation of our media environment, um, plus the overall media ecosystem is pretty fragile. Um, with fewer than one in five Americans paying for online news. And this is really um, what Laura was referring to in her very wise recommendation to um, that subscribing to uh, um, local outlets in particular can be one of the most important things we can do right now. Um, how do we move forward? What is the sort of path here, especially in the context of COVID-19? Um, my, my impression is that there's been a lot of recommendations coming out about how journalists should cover the virus, um, for example, out of USC's uh, Annenberg Center for Health Journalism, um, how people can, how journalists can fight misinformation, which is of course what um, Laura was talking about in her talk. The, I know Oxford's Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism has been publishing a lot on this topic as well, very consistent with the recommendations that she shared. Uh, and similar to what she was saying, I think um, it's especially important to think about the value of, of local news in communicating about the pandemic. Um, even in today's digital environment, there are good data that people really look to their local news at times like this. Um, and this is something I know that the University of Texas's uh, Center for Media Engagement is tracking really carefully. Um, finally, just to, to con some concluding thoughts for public health communicators, um, especially those working in departments of health around the country. Um, you know, I think there's really some agreed upon best practices uh, for crisis communication that, you know, um, two of them in particular that I think are particularly critical are being transparent and truthful, even when it's bad news, which of course right now and unfortunately is, uh, and really leading with scientists and science, um, needing to hear from experts. Uh, again, this is very much consistent with, with Laura's recommendations, I think. Um, politicization does threaten um, public trust somewhat, but even across the ideological spectrum, what we're seeing is um, still evidence of trust in scientists and public health experts. Um, that's who we need to hear from. And as Laura said, I think journalists have a super critical role in amplifying those voices um, at a time like this. So thank you very much. I look forward to any uh, questions and comments. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, those of you online, may know this, but you could look at us now, all three of us, um, Laura, Rebecca, and myself, either in active speaker view, so that highlights the person actually speaking, because now we're going to go into dialogue mode, or gallery view, just have all of us at once. And uh, if you are having any technical issues, you can use that same email address, consortm at uman.edu. Keep those questions coming. I got a lot here. Uh, and I'd like to kick off and maybe start back with you, Laura, anchoring, this combines several questions that we've gotten online. Um, right now, at least on my phone, the top headline in the Washington Post is White House prediction of virus deaths mystifies experts and Trump's advisors. And it really opens up this question of what choices are you making at the Washington Post? How do you think about it when you, you want to cover official statements? This was, came out of a big press briefing and public briefing by the White House. But you're concerned that some of the science being presented may not be fully supported or may just be wrong. How do you do that? Yeah, that is one of the biggest challenges. Um, it has been, to some extent, always the case that uh, official pronouncements might not be correct and you don't want to amplify misinformation. Uh, one thing that I think the, the Post and the New York Times and other major publications have have changed um, specifically in the Trump administration is, um, you know, Trump says a lot of things that aren't true. And we used to headline articles, you know, Trump says X. 
which is true. He, he did say X, that's, that's not wrong. Um, however, X isn't true. So we've kind of evolved to the point of saying, you know, Trump uh, repeats false claim that, or Trump mistakenly, or, you know, repeats misinformation that. We're a little reluctant to, to say lie, you know, because even though it's a nice thin word that would fit well in a headline, um, in, a, in a simple word that is, you know, could be accurate. The thing with lie is that it implies um, intention to lie rather than just not knowing any better. So we've tended to avoid that word. Um, so in headlines, we're trying to be more clear when something is not correct. And also with our alerts, if anybody has their phone set up to get automatic alerts, we're being much more cautious about just alerting things he says, especially around coronavirus, because you know, he's, he seems to have moved beyond saying it's a hoax, but for a for very long time, he was saying, oh, it's not true, the media is making it up, they wanna scare you, they wanna you know, stop my reelection. And so um, we're, we're, we're trying to just make sure that in covering him, we're not covering misinformation. Uh, and then especially, you know, when, when, when they repeat, when they presented this idea that the estimated U.S. deaths would be 100,000 to 200, 240,000, um, that, you know, the, the, the experts we've all been talking to are like, yeah, maybe, um, but we sure would like to know, you know, what are the error bars? What data did they put in? What's the time frame? Is it 100,000 deaths in the next two months? Is it in the next two years? Um, you know, as you all know, in the normal process of of research, you you share your work, you show you know what your data are, what the statistics you ran are, and this was just kind of put up there in a very simplified way that made a lot of the people we were talking to um, very concerned that um, they, we just don't know enough to know how to evaluate what they're saying. So yeah, those are those are decisions we we grapple with a lot, and so we we try to say very clearly in every article, um, you know, not just who said what, but what's the evidence for the thing that was being said. Rebecca, did you want to add a perspective on that? No, I mean, I think that I think it's a, an incredible challenge um, to be dealing with right now. And I think Laura's point about not trying to amplify the misinformation as part of the correction is very much steeped in the best research we have to suggest that that is, um, that is a, a, an unintended consequence of trying to sort of debunk um, misinformation or, or lies um, by basically perpetuating them and sort of distributing them. People's ability to sort of um, distinguish. They often forget the um, the source of the information, and they can't necessarily parse it. So I think that's um, a, a strategy, really, that's evidence based at this point. Yeah. Let me ask another question that's coming up. Um, back with you, Laura. Have you gotten a story where you ever worried? Uh, this is. This has the potential to be so alarming. And you both called for transparency, right? But have you ever hit this question of how do we communicate this in a way that doesn't cause panic or paralysis and that keeps um, people's ability to process the information intact? Yeah, that's a good question. And we, we grapple with this a lot um, in climate change coverage. Um, I mean, one of the challenges is to, to find ways to cover climate change, to find stories that aren't just unremittingly grim, because uh, it, it's just so bad. It's like mind-bendingly bad. It's terrible. Um, it's getting worse. Uh, and and one of the problems is it's, you know, it's like the expansion of the universe. Not only is the universe expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion, and it's just hard to understand. Uh, and that's what's happening with climate change, too. You know, if you look back at previous models, there's always a range of, you know, what could the impacts be and, you know, what, what part of the range, what's, what, what uh, line are we on? And with, you know, every year with more and more information, I mean, this year will be a blip because global commerce has ground to a halt. Um, but the more we learn, the worse it is. And the more we learn about, feed, you know, about negative feedback loops where, um, or, well, there are positive feedback loops, but that's a problem because positive sounds good. Um, but you know, where you have ice melting and then that changes the reflectivity of the ice and that leads to more warming, which means to more melting. And we've just seen these catastrophic cycles. And um, it's, it's really a challenge for, uh, for climate reporters to, to find ways to communicate the importance without 
sounding alarmist, um, you know, sounding the alarm without sounding alarmist, and to, to make people engaged and to, to help them comprehend, because at some point it's, it's just so hard to think about and the consequences are so dire that um, I think anybody would just you know, want to not think about it. So Rebecca, have you thought about this, maybe both from the standpoint of patients because of your work on cancer and the more general public? I mean, we're all real people. We have emotions. So yeah. how do you report the truth when it's incredibly worrisome? Well, and especially now where you're in the danger of actually being overloaded quite quickly, right? I mean, I think the, the concern at this point, I think, would almost be um, information overload um, to the extent where you're, that is the sort of paralysis that you're talking about. I don't, I don't think any of us have ever, as sort of Laura intimated, people, are, people who have you know, generally had low news consumption patterns are, are, are much higher right now than they, they have been perhaps in years or even their whole lives because of what's happening. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, we are, I was just teaching my undergrads in my large media effects um, class about information processing and how we, um, how we as humans sort of engage with information and what, those, what that process looks like and um, how much of it we frankly don't attend to because we can't, because we, it, we reach that overload point. Um, and the, the two critical you know, factors that we need to really um, engage with information in a, in a deep and systematic way are to be sort of motivated to process it and to be able to. Um, so motivation and ability being those two key sort of psychological mechanisms for, um, for getting us to, to engage with information. And right now, you know, ability is probably the major barrier for a lot of us, right? And it's not an ability in, this, in the static sense of, you know, education or literacy, but, you know, fleeting sort of temporal ability, like I'm too distracted, I'm too exhausted, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed and I can't even process, I cannot, it, it's, it's beyond the scope of what I can do right now. So um, in some of the data that we're starting to collect in our team, we're actually gonna be probing just how much news avoidance people are engaging in right now and how they're trying to sort of mitigate um, the potential negative consequences of, of, of overload. Um, so it's a real concern and I don't think there are any good answers at this point. There's a very interesting question from a colleague here at the U uh, from the perspective of scientists. And Laura, you were encouraging scientists to think about reaching out to the media and responding when they get media requests. I'm gonna paraphrase the question. It seems to me that the risk versus reward for scientists to talk with the media is an issue, especially for younger scientists because of the risk that the scientists may inadvertently make a misstep in how they portray the science. Uh, and um, that could actually come back to haunt them. That could have impact on their career. So there's, it's not zero risk in that sense, especially I think for scientists who don't have a long history of engaging with the media. So how, how can you make it safe or hospitable for scientists, particularly because they too right now are very stressed, uh, to engage with the media? Sure. Yeah, I, I understand the fear. I've um, I've been the subject of I've been, I've been quoted before, and sometimes the quote, you know, I, I read the article. I'm like, did I say that? I'm pretty sure I didn't say that. Um, so yes, the fear is real. I think the thing to know is that journalists want to get it right, like just as much as scientists. We want the right data, we want to tell the right story, we want to explain things correctly, we hate to have to write corrections. We do them as a, a virtue signaling that if we get something wrong, we will fix it. Um, but, you know, particularly, you know, depending on your field, of course, there are, you know, different issues that, you know, will be politicized, could be misrepresented, they could, you know, there could be kind of a motivated, uh, motivated interviewing or something like that. So I think the things to do are to type, to kind of demystify it. So um, if you get contacted, you know, the first thing you should do is look up the reporter. Uh, are, are they writing for a reputable news source? Do they, have they been covering this field? Are they likely to know what they're talking about? And that can just kind of help you 
determine, you know, am I starting from, you know, is this, I mean, sports reporters know a ton of things I don't know, um, but we have, you know, sports reporters around the country who aren't covering baseball right now because there's no baseball season. So they, if they're reporting on, on COVID-19, um, you know, you just want to go in knowing that you'll talk to them at a, at a different level than if you're talking to somebody from Stat News who's been covering it from the beginning. That's just one example. But, but definitely do some due diligence on the reporter and make sure there's somebody who's, who's reputable for an outlet that's reputable. Um, and there, there is a risk. There's a, a lot of reward too. Um, you know, if they're asking you about your own research or about your field, um, you know, you've devoted your career to this subject, in most cases supported in part with taxpayer money, um, it really is, you know, it's an opportunity to help people understand why what you do matters and, um, you know, interest people in it, engage people in it, maybe, you know, recruit students uh, to your field. So there are a lot of like pro-social reasons to do it. As far as minimizing risk, um, you know, the, there, there are things you can do in the interview, like if, you know, you can ask, you can ask frequently, you know, did that make sense to you? How would you paraphrase this? Um, are there any, you know, any other questions you have for me? Like, did that make sense? How, you know, what do you think is important here? Um, like, you could say it's definitely a conversation. So the reporter will be asking questions, but you can ask questions to the reporter too, and ask how they mean to use this. What, you know, what what, what kind of publication? What's their audience looking for? Um, and you know, don't. I think sometimes. Um, people who aren't contacted often by reporters, like it's a little intimidating, um, but reporters are kind of like snakes, like they're more scared of you than you are of them. So, um, you know, just, uh, it, it's just, a, it's a human conversation in, in, you know, except in rare cases where you have, uh, you know, motivated media, um, they, they do want to get it right. They want to represent you fairly. Uh, there's another question here. I'm sympathetic to this question because I'm a lawyer ethicist involved in COVID response. And this is asking um, us to expand the focus because, of course, there are other folks, too, involved in this COVID epidemic. Uh, philosophers, scholars in the humanities, um, ethicists, lawyers, etc. So how do you think about reaching out to those folks and involving the, them in this conversation? Yeah, that's a good question. And we did, at the Post, we have, um, when we've covered uh, like the Do Not Resuscitate article I, I showed a screenshot of, um, we, we definitely do uh, call bioethicists a lot. Um, and then our financial team uh, just had, have, has had some stories about like legal liability and masks and how that has slowed down the distribution of masks in the, in the ramping up of production. So there's definitely angles there. Um, one thing, so that you could, you know, write, write your own opinion piece, um, Slate, like I said, has a, has a, the, where I used to write for, um, has a whole department called Jurisprudence, uh, which is largely articles written by lawyers about legal issues, or not, just, you know, about lawyers who have, you know, who train their expertise on any subject that's of interest to people. Um, and then, uh, so that I highly recommend working with them, they're good editors at Slate and um, you know, any opinion place too. I don't know as well of, of databases where you can identify yourself as a source for legal reporters like you can for science and, and health journalists, um, but your, your public information, if you're, at, if you're based at a university, uh, the public information office, I'm sure we'd love to hear from you about your ideas and could, could help you, you know, either uh, circulate your name as a source or um, help you pitch stories. Um, there's a question here, really, for both of you, probably. Maybe we'll start with Laura, but then go to Rebecca, about censorship. Um, the question anchors on YouTube and the issue of um, balancing, in effect, efforts, I guess, at YouTube and other platforms like Facebook to pull off uh, inappropriate content, uh, incorrect content, conspiracy content, and the risk that it pulls down other content, opinion content. So it's really about the role of, of that kind of monitoring and censorship. Yeah, that's, that's a big challenge. And you know, because, well, for a lot of reasons, but partly because the, the traffic is just so huge, 
a lot of it is algorithm driven or, you know, it's a lot of it is AI that's making the decisions. And those algorithms are, you know, invisible to us, probably invisible to the people at the, at the platforms. Um, so you really need humans making that call. Um, and it's a, it's a hard one to do. Um, I think, right, and it's, and of course, yeah, it's like a diagnostic test, the sensitivity and the selectivity are, are in balance, false positives, false negatives. Uh, and right now it seems like the, from my perception, they're erring in the, um, in the direction of allowing more things to circulate. I, I don't think they've overcorrected or gotten to the point where they're, they're getting too many, you know, false positives and, and calling things, um, you know, conspiracies that aren't, but that could certainly happen. Rebecca, did you want to comment? No, I mean, I think just to, to echo those points, I think it, it is a real challenge. And when you don't, when I, I think that the social media or, uh, uh, institutions are, are trying quite hard at this point, um, especially in the COVID context, I think they're taking it very seriously. Um, there, it's not going to be perfect. There is, as uh, you know, Laura suggested, the sort of recall and precision around um, ability to do that effectively, algorithmically is, is challenging. I think there are other ways, though, that all of us can be um, not just relying on, you know, Facebook and the like to, to intervene, um, but we can all be intervening, too, when we see misinformation. And there's good evidence. I mentioned my colleague, Emily Braga, um, has, has um, done a lot of work on this, of which she's called observational correction and the extent to which, especially expert sources like CDC, but also the rest of us, if we you know, see something on social media that's incorrect, that's inaccurate um, to, to, to say as much. And the act of doing that, other people will see that. Um, and that act of sort of observational correction, that that can actually be quite powerful. So to not, you know, on the one hand, I think we do need sort of those institutional level sort of interventions, but it does not abdicate responsibility from the rest of us for, for, for playing our part. There are a couple questions that get us back to the foundational question of, do people trust scientists anyway? <laughs> uh, one person writes, scientists were so revered in the mid 20th century with the discovery of vaccines, I'll throw in antibiotics to that, space race, uh, advances in medicine, but it seems that the standing of science and scientists has fallen and, and been challenged. Uh, and you alluded to this, uh, Laura, some of the challenges, conspiracy theories, distrust and the like. Um, so at a moment when trust in science seems so crucial, how do we deal with that, that erosion and the ongoing challenges to that trust? Yeah, that's a good question. And Pew has, uh, uh, Pew Research and Polling, they have some really good uh, kind of long-term data showing that, that it's true, that the, the reverence, the trust in uh, science and scientists has gone down gradually over the past several decades. Um, so scientists are still, but if you rank order, who's the most trusted? Scientists and doctors are way up there. Um, journalists are way at the bottom. Uh, and, but I think for both science and journalism, there's an increasing partisanship where, um, which is really unfortunate, as Rebecca pointed out, like it's, it's just dangerous if, if what you, you know, if your trust in fact-based material is, you know, gets a, a partisan uh, buzz to it that, it, and you, you know, it's an us versus them thing that's just really bad. Um, but we're definitely seeing in, in journalism uh, in the past several years that people who identify as liberal are, are much more uh, trusting of the news media um, and and people who are conservative are much less, um, even more so than before. Uh, and then we're seeing that we're starting to see that pattern with science too. That um, trust in science is becoming sort of a self-identified thing for 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 liberals and for conservatives. There's, I, I think, especially around issues of climate change. Um, that, that's the big one uh, where you're seeing more and more conservatives say they just they don't trust scientists and that that's really a shame. Rebecca, did you want to comment? No, I think that's all you know exactly right and it's um, it, you know the extent to which um, as sort of it's not just that health and science issues have become politicized but the very ideas of like facts and evidence have become politicized. Um, which is something I don't know that any of us really expected in quite, this, in quite the way that it's unfolded. And, and that makes it, 
incredibly challenging, but I, I do think Laura's right. Trust in science is not as low as we think it is. Um, I think that it is socially patterned, but it's actually, um, the trust is still there, very much so along, among large swaths of the public. And, and that's all the more reason why I think at moments like these, um, trust that, you know, the sort of science and, and public health experts should be, should be at the forefront. There's some great questions here that bring this issue back to all of us in our conversations with our neighbors. Uh, I guess across a great distance, ideally, with social distancing. I mean, people are asking, first of all, what is, this is a great question, what's an empathetic way of understanding why people believe conspiracy theories and false information. And then people are asking, if I'm in a conversation with my neighbor or my colleague and they really are citing untrustworthy sources and, and stuff that isn't scientifically true, what do I do? How do I continue that conversation and, and hopefully move it in a positive direction. Um, maybe, Rebecca, you could start with that question, and then we'll go to Laura. Well, I think that's a really great question. I mean, there's no question that for, for years there's been conversation around the role that interpersonal um, communication can have in, in bridging the kinds of divides we're talking about, um, and it's so important to our democracy to be able to talk across um, across those divides um, to sort of speak to the other side, quote unquote, as it's called. And um, how to do it compassionately is a great question. I don't, I don't know that I have the answers to that. I think we're trying to figure that out, but maybe it's, it is, um, you know, I've seen examples of where people are trying to model that and, and play out different scenarios and then empirically assess whether that is a, a, a strategy that works. I think there's some indication that if you can um, approach with empathy to try to not denigrate. Um, uh, Naomi Oreskes has talked a lot about this, a uh, historian uh, of science at Harvard who's written, you know, Merchants of Doubt and thought a lot about these issues over the years in the context of climate change, just sort of think about where people are coming from, why they would believe what they believe, not to put them down personally, but to try to engage with the substance of it and, and, and bring, you know, um, what you can uh, to the table in terms of the evidence that you might have. Um, I think actually it's probably a really untapped resource. There's a lot of concern about this idea of um, echo chambers and that we're all stuck in our own little parts and bubbles. And actually a lot of that's overblown. It's not quite as much of a problem as we think it is. And so all the more reason to not think that, that that's the case, that that has to be the case, that it's a preordained uh, situation. You very much, I think, can talk to those who disagree with you. Um, and we probably all should be doing it a lot more. Laura, what are your thoughts? Laura, can you hear me? Oh. Laura seems as if uh, she's frozen on my screen, so hopefully she will get unfrozen and log back in uh, because this is an important question. Um, let me just take it one step further, um, Rebecca, with you. Uh, what we're seeing is um, uh, a question that takes us a step further. Uh, there are a lot of health professionals, this person writes, who are anti-vax um, and people who are in the trenches, perhaps nurses saying they've been in the field for years, uh, they have firsthand experiences, I guess elevating anecdotal evidence and their own perception of what the science is. And um, what are your thoughts about how to constructively engage with that, with that perspective? Sure, I'm, I'm glad to try to answer. I do see, I think Laura is back. So if you want yes. to give her the opportunity to, to check in, that's, that's fine to go ahead with her first if you want. Well, let me go to you. That, Laura, I was just taking, thanks for coming back. <laughs> just taking this one step further because we have a further question, I think from the trenches, health professionals asking about health professionals who are themselves anti-vax, according to this questioner, and who may really be relying on anecdotal evidence, their own sense of, well, I'm a nurse, I've been doing this X number of years, I haven't gotten sick, 
I don't need vaccination, et cetera. So again, it's this question of people, how to really empathetically and constructively engage. Yeah, it's it's the hardest thing. It's so hard. Um, and I swear my internet didn't go out just because I was trying to dodge that question. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, it, people are trying really hard to find good ways to do this. Um, some of the things that work are a little bit, um, you know, it's, it's compassionately and not patronizingly to, to, to say, um, you know, I understand it's, it's intimidating, it's scary. Um, you know, the, one of the things we try to do when we write about, when we cover back the anti-vaccine movement or cover vaccines is we never show a picture of a baby screaming while it's getting vaccinated um, because that just activates all these, oh, you know, they're gonna harm my child's tropes. And, and it's really easy to activate that. And, and it's really hard to remember. I mean, maybe we'll, we'll see what COVID-19 does to, to the anti-vaccine movement, but you know, for people who haven't experienced measles in living memory, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to weigh the, you know, what, what you're, what's the benefit of, of getting vaccinated. Um, so, I mean, I think that this is where kind of activating people's, um, trying, trying to activate their best natures, um, I think really emphasizing herd immunity for people Oh no, I think we have another freeze here. Mm. Uh, okay. Oh. Keep going, Laura. I okay. think there's a little instability in the internet. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a plot. Um, emphasizing herd immunity, you know, that you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for infants, you're doing it for people who are in cancer treatment. I think that can be very effective. Um, and then having the messenger be somebody they trust. So if it's a nurse, another nurse, uh, so that they're, you know, so that they empathize with each other, feel like they're part of the same team, that they're part of the us, instead of activating the us versus them problems. We just have a few minutes left. Uh, we have a question here that kind of takes us back to the big picture. Please comment about the often deployed criticism that, quote, the media has a marked liberal bias. Do you think that's true? And the questioner is asking, has it contributed to the current situation where, uh, where the president and press are often at loggerheads? Yeah, I, I don't think it's true. Um, I understand in, in this administration why it looks like that. I mean, you, anytime there's a, a conservative administration, you know, the press, like one of the main um, responsibilities of journalists is to be watchdogs, to be, uh, to, to really hold uh, politicians, administrations accountable for what they're doing right or wrong. And so anytime you have a, a conservative government, then, then that, that kind of amplifies that perception. Um, but the, the biggest commitment is to um, being accurate, to reporting what's happening in the world. And of course, that's, it, it's not that there's some objective reality and we're just like shining a light on it. That's, that's the ideal, but you know, of course, every reality comes with what are your values. And um, I think the journalists tend to see themselves as advocates for um, you know, fight, fighting the power, basically. Uh, being advocates for people who don't have a voice, advocates for people who don't already have access to power, and holding those who do have power accountable. And so that, um, that tends to you know, align with some priorities uh, that, that tend to be more on the, on the liberal side. Um, most, most journalists, in my experience, are very, are, you know, try to be apolitical, try to you know, see both sides, try to, in any story where there are two legitimate opinions, to, to give the best argument on both sides. And not all, not all subjects have two sides. You know, with evolution, we don't give equal weight to creationism. Um, with climate change, we don't give equal weight to climate deniers. Um, but when it's a policy issue, then we do try to, to represent both. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a challenge. And as, you know, as we get so much criticism um, from Trump supporters specifically, uh, you know, it, it, it does, you know, so my, my um, the editor in chief at, at um, the Washington Post says we're not at war with the administration, we're at work. We're trying to do our jobs and our jobs are to hold it accountable. 
Let me ask you both a concluding question, which is really, where do we go from here? I mean, the, this coronavirus crisis, as you alluded to, Laura, is likely to go on a long time. And meanwhile, it is not the only science health story, including environmental stories. So are there changes you'd like to see? One questioner even asks, what are your plans for Scientific American? <laughs> you may not be at liberty to share that yet, but I'd like to ask first Laura and Rebecca, really, where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, best case scenario is this is like a reachable moment where, you know, health journalists and, and any kinds of experts have been warning for decades that a pandemic is coming. And, you know, there was a certain audience for that, or, you know, a certain number of people who paid attention, but yet for decades, we, you know, underfunded public health efforts. Um, you know, there, there's just been a lot of, a lot of things that made this worse in the United States than it needed to be. So, you know, this is a terrible moment, but hopefully it's a moment for uh, people to understand, you know, how disease works, how the healthcare system works, how we can make it more equitable, how we can get more, you know, how we can save lives with good policies and how bad policies can cost lives. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the idealist outcome is people feel more connected. Um, you know, we're all just vectors for viruses at this point or potential vectors. And you know, to understand how what, what, you know, our decisions to, to go to the office or not can have two weeks later mean life or death for somebody who was on the metro with us, on the subway with us. So I think this, this shows more than ever how important it is um, to have, you know, an evidence-based science, health, environment, uh, literate uh, way of understanding the world, way of, of, of running things, a way of understanding controversies, and that, um, you know, that I, I, I hope people will understand more that uh, evidence and science and, and health and environment are, are things that matter to everybody and matter to, to the most important issues of our time. Great. Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to feel as optimistic and I, I am, I, 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 I'm not dispositionally as optimistic a person, but I, I, I'm trying very hard in all seriousness to, to see it the same way because I think anything short of that um, would be kind of catastrophic, right? I mean, we're really at a critical moment here um, in thinking about ways in which we need to come together and coalesce in a way that um, only a pandemic can force you to, to do. Um, and so that my hope is that, um, I, don't, I don't know how realistic it is, but I hope very much that we'll see some of these chasms that have been growing and growing in terms of um, um, political, sort of, you know, that partisan um, interpretation on things that we've seen for um, the last couple of years, that that'll start to, to come together. I'm, I'm hoping that this will be a sort of equalizer in that way and may bring us together in, in ways um, that would be really, really helpful and effective. Time will tell. Well, I wanna thank you both for the work that you're doing. Laura, I know you're in the trenches 24 seven. And thank you for taking time, thank you both. And thanks to our audience for spectacular questions. Remember, you're gonna get your evaluations and tracker forms. Uh, we'd love your feedback. And join us for the third and final webcast in this series. It's gonna be on Thursday, April 16th. It's Professor Vish Viswanath from Harvard School of Public Health, who's really gonna look at a different angle, communicating science to reduce health disparities in a world of communication inequalities. I think a lot of us take for granted that we can get on Zoom, that we can learn by remote. What if you can't? Uh, that is a huge challenge right now. Uh, go to the consortium homepage, in, uh, in order to register. And um, thank you all. Stay well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>